All right. I'm here with Chris Nicholson. He is the author of Photographing National Parks, and he's part of the National Parks at Night group. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah, of course. So Chris was with us in Acadia National Park, and he's going to be one of our instructors in Moab as well. And uh, obviously, being part of National Parks at Night, he knows everything there is to know about night photography. And we are going to talk today about uh, going a little bit beyond. The other day, we talked with Ian Norman. He talked a lot about uh, equipment. We're going to talk some about settings and all that stuff. Sound like fun? Yeah, yeah sounds great. <laughs> all right. So, um, so let's talk about like... Uh, just, just basic camera settings for shooting at night. What do people need to know to get their cameras ready to shoot Milky Way, stars, all that stuff? Uh, well, first thing is you got to know your camera because uh, you are literally working in the dark. So, you know, a lot of times you hear, oh, you should know your camera so well you can use it in the dark. <laughs> shooting at night, you literally do. <laughs> yeah, that literally, uh, especially, you know, like shooting in places like arches and canyon lands under a new moon, it is really going to be dark. Uh, so if, if you don't know how to use your camera that well in the dark, just find a room without windows, turn off the lights and do it. Can you find your ISO? Can you, uh, can you change your shutter speed and your aperture? Those are the easy ones. But um, you know, how about turning on and off your long exposure noise reduction? Can you do these things without being able to see your, your controls? Right. And, and like you say, there's maybe like six or seven things you need to be able to do and, and kind of know what those are ahead of time and right. be able to do that. You don't need to there's crazy menu settings or whatever, but, uh, but do those five or six things and you'll be good. Yeah. You, you can use, uh, you know, you can use a flashlight too, but the, mm -hmm. the danger in using a flashlight is you, you turn it on and it's bright and now you've ruined your night vision. Uh, so if you do want to use a flashlight, uh, and it can, can be useful, you know, to get something out of your bag or whatever. Uh, get, get a red one, you know, get a flashlight. You know, you know, if you're using a headlamp, try to get one that has a, a red bulb as well, because that'll allow, allow you to see, to see your camera, to see in your bag, to check around and make sure there's not rocks or something you're tripping over without ruining your night vision for five minutes afterward. Right. And when you're out with a group, like if you're on one of your workshops for National Parks at Night or you're at our Moab event, uh, you got to worry about everybody else. Maybe they're in the middle of an exposure or something. Right. So we'll talk yeah. we'll talk etiquette today, too. Um, so but what's of all the things, what's the most difficult thing when people are first learning night photography? What's the most the difficult thing for people to get right? Um, I'd say two, two things. W one is getting over the hump of understanding that your camera works pretty much the same in the dark as it does in the light. So people will say, how, you know, how do I even go about figuring out an exposure for shooting under stars? It's exactly the same. You know, you, you find out what ISO you need and what shutter speed and what aperture you need. It's the exact same process. You just can't be afraid for that ISO to be at 6,400 or for that shutter speed to be at 30 seconds or five minutes. Uh, you just kind of have to get over that that hump, that mental hump, and then you're well on your way to the exposure end of it. The other technical aspect that a lot of people have trouble with is focusing at night. Um, and that's a big one, but it's certainly doable. Uh, there's a lot of tricks you can use. Uh, for one, you can, you can focus your lens in daylight. You know, so if you want to focus at infinity, you could autofocus on something in daylight and then turn off your autofocus, tape down the lens, and now you're set to go for your night shoots. Uh, you can use a flashlight to illuminate what you want to uh, what you want to focus on. Uh, a lot of times, you can shine a flashlight on, you know, say a tree that you're focusing on, and that's enough to autofocus at night. Um, if it's not, you could also try putting the flashlight in the scene to what you want to focus on. So that same example with the tree, go put the go put the flashlight on a branch and then autofocus on that, um, and then switch it back, like you said, right? If you use autofocus, then switch it back to manual so it doesn't, because then you're good the rest of the time, right? Yeah, yeah, for as long as you're shooting, you know, for whatever you focused on. Because um, I've had people do that, and then they're like, well, go put that flashlight out there again. I got to go autofocus again. Well, wait, hey, hey, hey. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Once you're focused, you're focused. Turn right. off the autofocus uh, and just leave it be. Um, if you're focusing, you know, if you need to focus in the dark on infinity, uh, if you're in a dark enough area with bright enough stars, a lot of times you can you use live view. Um, even if you're focusing on something on the foreground with a flashlight, you can use live view. Uh, zoom in on live view and use, um, you can just get a, a loop. 
mm -hmm. and right up to the back of the camera and use live view to try to focus. Uh, you can do the same thing again, you know, back to using a flashlight to illuminate something in the foreground if the autofocus isn't working. Again, use a loop and live view and get nice and sharp. But these are all kind of tricks for focusing in the dark. If you want to, and they all have their drawbacks. There's all situations where, uh, all of them have situations where they're not going to work. The one foolproof way to focus at night is to use hyperfocal distance. And uh, it's, a, it's a more complex thing to learn. It's, uh, I've never known anybody who's understood hyperfocal distance uh, quickly. Uh, it, it, there is a learning, uh, a learning curve, but it's, it's worth it. Uh, if, uh, if you can learn that, then you can focus in any situation in the dark. You just uh, set to your hyperfocal distance and, and you know you're good. Hmm. All right. So that's part of what makes this a little tricky, though, too, is that it's not just like, just do it like this every time. There's different ways and they work in different situations depending on what you're dealing with. Um, when we were in Acadia, we had the full moon out, so that was probably a whole lot easier to focus, right? Yeah, if you need to focus on infinity and uh, you're shooting in a moonlit situation, you can autofocus on the moon every time. Oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you don't even, yeah, it's like your own flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So let's see. Let, how about etiquette? Well, you go out and you teach a lot of groups uh, and you might have a group of five to 10 people or whatever, and we'll do the same thing when we go to Moab. Uh, when someone's new to this, what are some things people want to be thinking about? And I think I, when I went out with you and we shot at Jordan Pond in Acadia, I think you went over some of these things with people and you kept teaching them. I was really impressed by how much you were teaching people the correct etiquette along the way. So give us a couple of tips. Uh, etiquette's pretty important. Uh, shooting at night in a group there's a lot of advantages to it. Um, you know, you, you have help if you want to collaborate on something. Uh, if you want to collaborate on light panning, uh, you've got people around to help. There's also a safety in numbers. Uh, if you're nervous about being out in the wilderness in the dark, then it's nice to have people around. Um, but there are drawbacks. Uh, I'd say there's a drawback, and that is the light painting and flashlight issue. You're shooting in the dark. You might be in the middle of a 30-second exposure and then somebody 10 feet away from you turns on a flashlight and ruins your shot. Uh, so that's why etiquette's important. Uh, so what we, what we teach and what we practice, if I'm just out you know, sh shooting with the guys uh, that I work with, then we, it, we practice this too. Before we turn on a flashlight, we always say, is anybody open? You know, is anybody, you're just calling out, is anybody's shutter open right now? If I turn on my flashlight, am I going to ruin an exposure for you? And then you just wait, you know, uh, yes, no, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm open right now. Give me 30 seconds. Um, so it's all about communication. Uh, just making sure that you're not ruining anybody's photos and letting them know, let them know that they're not going to be ruining yours. Do you remember my story about that? After, after we went out with you, <laughs> <laughs> well, you do? <laughs> Is yeah. that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, after we went out with you, uh, and you kept saying that to everybody, are you open? I'm like, all right, I, I want to be cool too. And the next morning, it, we went out before sunrise with a different group, and we saw someone else just out there on their own shooting. And then it was dark. I asked him, are you open? And he gave me the weirdest look. And he's just like, what are you talking about? Am I, what do you think, this is a store? <laughs> like, forget it. I thought I was being cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Photographers, we, we have our own jargon that can get us in trouble, right? We, uh, we were doing a workshop in Cuyahoga Valley National Park last spring. And we had a guy, uh, U.S. citizen, but he's Mexican born. And he's got a, a Mexican accent. Uh, and he was out shooting on train tracks, which was perfectly legal. They're in the park. Uh, but two rangers come up on in the dark, this person shining flashlights on the, on the train tracks. And they, and they turn on their lights to try to see what's going on. And our guy yells, hey, what are you guys doing? I'm shooting here. And it's the Mexican <laughs> accent, which was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> the two rangers were suspicious about what was going on. Oh, that's pretty funny. Yeah. We get ourselves I, in all sorts of trouble. So we start yelling from now on, hey, I'm photographing over here. Photograph. So, right? Uh, yes, I'm much like better. <laughs> oh, man. So, so that's a big part of what you teach and what we try and do is the etiquette. Um, you got to get your camera settings right. You got to know your camera ahead of time. You kind of got to work on all those things ahead of time. But once you get the basics down, 
it's kind of magical what you can produce, right? I mean, when people are getting these shots for the first time and they're like, I can't believe I just got that shot and it, it looks amazing and I see the stars and all that. Um, but then we go even further beyond that. Like, what are some other things that we can do to make the shot a little more interesting? Well, light painting for sure. Um, uh, light painting is like opening up a whole new world of creative opportunities. Uh, you know, we, we, we think a lot of times, but like I'm sure you've heard the analogy about the difference between painting and photography is that photography is the art of exclusion of figuring out what to keep out of your frame and painting is an art of inclusion where you're deciding what to include. Light painting bridges the gap between those uh, because you're, when you're shooting in the dark and then you start adding painting, you are literally choosing what to reveal in the scene and what to leave in the shadows. And uh, I could explain this a hundred, a hundred different ways, but it's not the same as going out and actually shooting. And I love when people kind of get that moment of, of wow. You, you know, like you can see it in their eyes when they realize all the different things that they can do with photography that they weren't able to do in daylight. Uh, I just had that experience in the Smoky Mountains, uh, shooting with a friend who had never tried light painting and uh, he couldn't get enough of it. I had to drag him out of there by the end of the night. <laughs> yeah, and so what you're talking about is taking a shot that may be completely dark or close to it uh, mm -hmm. when you just take the normal shot, but then you have a flashlight or or some people use like a LED panel or whatever or something yeah. like that, and you add light to it, but now you're choosing where that light is going to be, right? Right, and, yeah. And, and, and so whatever you shine it on is going to show up in the shot and it wouldn't have otherwise. Right, yeah, and uh, choosing where the light's going to be, I like that you said it that way, because when people are new to light painting, uh, it can be very seductive to paint everything in the scene, and you don't want to do that. You want to leave some things in shadow, and leave uh, some mystery, and so you're choosing what in the composition is important to illuminate. Um, you know, looking for your primary and your secondary subjects and, and just illuminating, the, uh, illuminating those in a way that's artful. It's almost like sculpting. It's like you're, you're kind of carving the darkness out of the scene to reveal what's behind it. I'm going to ask this next question because I think I know the answer from when we were, we went to Eagle Lake, right? Uh, that last night yeah. I was there and uh, we went at night. And when you're light painting, do you just stand behind your camera the whole time to do it? or not, and why? No, I go. in fact, I would say stand anywhere besides behind your camera. Um, and it's another common mistake uh, when people first start light painting. And I've seen people, you know, they, they've tried light painting on, on their own and, and they're disappointed and it's almost always because they painted from behind the camera. So if you think about it in terms of, you know, we'll use the analogy of daytime photography. Again, you would hardly ever shoot with the sun to your back, right? Because it makes the landscape flat. So it's the same thing with light painting. If you're painting from behind the camera, everything's going to be flat. So you want to get to the side. I mean, get 90 degrees if you can. Backlight if you can. Uh, get into the scene and photograph from, uh, I'm sorry, uh, light paint from extreme angles. And that brings out the texture of the scene. It creates shadows, uh, creates interesting shadows, and adds depth. And so you have a trigger that you use, right? You're not hitting your thing and then running over to the side, right? You, you use right. or, or Or do you do both? I don't know. Um, I mostly use a wireless trigger. Uh, different people do different things. Uh, I like using the wireless trigger because I can, I can get to where I need to light paint without rushing. Uh, and then once I'm in place, I can just fire remotely. Uh, I can see the little LED in the camera go. I know the shutter's open and I start my light painting. Uh, Matt Hill, who I work with, uh, he prefers a different method. He uses an intervalometer and he sets the timer so he'll give himself, you know, he says, well, you know, it takes 30 seconds to get into position. I'll give myself a minute. He'll set the intervalometer for one minute. And then he, again, watches for the LED or listens for the shutter. And then he knows he can start light painting. Uh, but the important thing is to give yourself time. Uh, what you don't want to do is be firing your camera and then running into the scene in the dark uh, to start light painting. Uh, give yourself some time to do it right and then do it safely. Yeah, it might be fine during the day, but light painting doesn't work very well then. Yeah whatever yeah, yeah forget it so um what do you recommend as far as a flashlight uh when you're doing these types of things when you're when you're light painting well anything that creates light you can use for light painting um but if you want to get particular about you know the best tools for the job uh we like coast lights uh coast uh, coast portland flashlights um my favorite's the hp 7r uh which is 300 lumen uh 300 lumens uh, it's very bright 
uh, it's hardly, I've hardly ever had trouble with this not being enough light to paint what I'm painting. Uh, it's also uh, white balanced very close to daylight. Uh, so you don't have to do a lot of adjustments, although it, it's kind of cool. So you can, it's, but it's easy to warm up with a, um, uh, with the CTO gel. You can focus it. And probably my favorite feature that would put this above other flashlights is the beam is uh, evenly illuminated from edge to edge. So a lot of times with less expensive flashlights, I mean, you got to paint like this and get the hot spot pointed in the right direction. But with this, the whole beam, because it's evenly illuminated, you don't have to move around so much. You can kind of paint in a very deliberate and uh, slow way, uh, really control the light. Uh, if anybody, right. when I've been out with people, yeah. usually they're they're wiggling all over the place with that thing. But I see right. that that's because the center of the beam is much uh, brighter than the rest of it, and they don't want that to just burn in. Is that is that my reading? Right. So if you can kind right? of picture your typical less expensive flashlight, just like you know the one you get at Home Depot and keep in the basement for when the fuses blow, uh, you can kind of picture that has that hot spot in the center. That's like you know three stops brighter than the rest of the beam. So you end up that that's really the only part that you're painting with the uh, outer, you know, 90% of that beam that's not as illuminated isn't doing anything for your exposure. Uh, but the coast flashlight edge to edge, perfectly illuminated. Uh, so it gives you a lot more to work with. That makes sense. So we'll put a link to that uh, in the notes here. Do you say like there, there's a discount or something too? Yeah. With national parks at night, we, we work with them uh, and, uh, they said we could pass along this discount code. It's for 30% off uh, of any of the flashlights at coastportland.com. And uh, the code is parks at night. Uh, one word parks at night and you can get 30% off the coast flashlights. Perfect. So we'll put the link and the code in the notes. Cool. And uh, that way you don't have to bring your Home Depot flashlight and get it, <laughs> but your hot spot in the middle, whatever, all that stuff. So yeah. uh, that, that's part of why I want to do these videos, though, is I just want people to be ready. When they get to Moab, I don't want them to show up and be like, hey, what things do I need? You know, we're, we're, Moab's a town, but you know, it's, you're not going to find all the best camera stores and whatever. I mean, I want people to be ready when they get there so that uh, we're, we're ready to just start shooting right away. So yeah, even if you haven't out. done light painting before, if you if you want to come, you know everybody's got good glass and good cameras. If you want to learn light painting, come with the right tool for the job, and uh, I'll make sure you know how to use it before you go. Yeah, and, and that's the best part is that uh, we're going to teach classes, and people get to uh, learn exactly how to do it. But then we're going to go out and shoot together. Like you said, it's hard to do unless you're actually in the field with the people. So you're going to take people out in these small groups and you're going to do one specific technique. You and I talked about this. You may have been the first person that brought it up to me. When we're, we didn't do this in Acadia, but we're going to do it for Moab because we're doing so much night specific photography mm -hmm. that we're going to say, your group is going out to this location. And when they get there, you're all going to be light painting or you're all going to be trying to shoot just the Milky Way, or you're going to maybe be doing star trails or something because it's difficult to have different people doing different things when you get there. Am I saying that right? This is all your idea, I think. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with, you know, if uh, we've got 10 people out and two people want to wander off 100 yards and shoot the stars, that's fine. But um, but if you're it, all right yeah. together and you're trying to help them, it's hard having different people do different things. It, it's it's hard if, if you've got 10 people who haven't done light painting before and they want to learn light painting, it's really hard in three hours to teach 10 people individually how to light paint uh, without it being just really quick hits and sound bite advice. So we don't want to do that, right? Right. Uh, we want, you know, we want everybody to go back at the end of the night feeling like they got at least one really good light painted photo. Uh, and could go back and, and somewhat do it themselves on their own. Exactly, right. So I, I find it's good uh, with a group, uh, if you've got a lot of people who haven't done it before, to do a, you know, a, a group demo. Uh, or a, a group light painting project and to uh, to show everybody at the same time exactly how this works and, and see it work on their camera. So not the demo from my camera, but, you know, set up, you know, come up with a composition and, the, and the, let's light paint this. Everybody shoot and we're going to show you how the light painting works. And then after that, split up, find a composition, maybe work in pairs so you can help each other out uh, and really get into you know, get enough into the nitty gritty so that you can go back to the hotel that night with, a, with at least one good photo. And, and that's ambitious. It's, you know, if, when I'm out shooting at night, if I come back with three good photos at the end of a whole night, 
that was a great night. And I'm talking about being for, out for, you know, six, seven hours. So if you, if you're new to this and you're going to go out for two or three hours and shoot to come back with one good photo is a good, but a challenging goal. Right. Cause when you're at night, you, you got to take time to get yourself in the right spot. Once you get there, you got to make sure your tripod's exactly how you want it. You got to work on that composition and then you got all these other settings that you're talking about. So it's not just like uh, shooting during the day and let's try this, let's try that. I, right. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. It's a more deliberate process. Um, right. And that's a good way to say it. You know, if, if you're, when you're doing a photo in daylight, if you've got a, an exposure of, you know, a thousandth of a second, uh, you can fire off different iterations of that pretty quickly. Um, and you can hone a concept and get your final photo in a few minutes. But at night, if you're dealing with, say, a 10 minute exposure, then when that exposure fails three times, well, now you're half hour into the process, right? So right. you're not going to hone an idea and nail it in less than a minute at night. It takes time. It's a deliberate process. And it takes time to go through that and get it right. So another thing I want to do, uh, we briefly mentioned that there is, is to shoot star trails. How, when you're shooting star trails, how do you do it? Because I know there's a couple different ways you could. Uh, yeah, you can do it a couple ways. Uh, you can do it with a long exposure, uh, which traditionally is the way to do it. So when we were shooting film, you had to do a long exposure. Anything at night had to be a long exposure. Uh, with digital, it opens up the possibility to do it with a bunch of short exposures too. So you can take... Um, you know, so like uh, you could do one 30 minute exposure or you could do 31 minute exposures and then stack those in post-production later. Uh, and there's advantages to each. Um, you know, if you do that one long exposure, one of the advantages is that you can shoot at a really low ISO, which makes for great image quality. The downside is that, especially if it's warm out, you're going to get long exposure noise. And that's very difficult to deal with in post-production. Uh, you can deal with it in camera by turning on the long exposure noise uh, reduction feature. But the, the way that that works is it takes a blank exposure after you're done. So if you do a half hour exposure, then the, then the camera is going to take a half hour blank exposure after that. You've just lost your camera for an hour. <laughs> right. Um, so maybe that works. Maybe you have a second camera that you can use, uh, and that's great if you do. But there's another way around it, and that's to do image stacking. So you could take the 31 minute exposures and then stack them in post-production. Uh, the downside is you have more post-production work to do, uh, but you can work around that issue that I just mentioned with the long exposure noise. Uh, and you can work around some other issues too. Uh, again, there's advantages and disadvantages to each that we'll be talking about next year. Nice. And you typically will, will stack them. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, it sounds complex, but you're just stacking all those exposures in Photoshop uh, as separate layers. And then just by changing the, the blend mode of those layers, that allows all the stars to come through and it creates the star trail um, kind of electronically by combining those 30 exposures. Okay. Or, or, I feel like or, when I've done it before, I use like some kind of a Photoshop action or something to combine them, but you don't even need to do that. You're saying if you get, you, the you don't have right. to, uh, you, you can, I mean, there's other software that, does the same thing. There's a, a, a there's a Photoshop script that'll automate uh, some of that process. Um, so there's different options as with anything with digital photography, right? There's like right. six hammers we can use for the same nail. <laughs> right. And, and that's going to be the best part about Moab is that we're going to teach you how to do this new type of photography. If you've never done it, we're going to take you out and do it. But then when you come back, you're going to have a chance to sit down and actually go through it. And if you can't get them to blend together, uh, we'll make Chris help you. So <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to help. We did it in Acadia a couple of times. There were people who wanted to try uh, star stacking. Uh, we had it, so in Acadia, it was full moon. And that's mm -hmm. another advantage of doing star stacking. If you had tried to do a half hour exposure in full moonlight, it would just, the sky would just blow out. Uh, but you can do those shorter exposures and build star trails that way uh, in bright moonlight. So we were doing it and um, doing it in the field. And it, it's hard to tell somebody when you're out at midnight in the dark in the national park, okay, when, when you get back, to your computer tomorrow morning, this is what you're going to do. That's hard. So instead we would just, you know, we would meet after lunch and walk through the process together. Right. So you wrote photographing national parks. Very good. Yeah. Oh, 
something like that. And so you're kind of the guy, you, you know, uh, you know, all the best places in the national parks. Uh, we loved, uh, you did the closing presentation from Acadia to Zion, right? Uh, yes. at, uh, at Acadia at the out of Acadia event. That was the closing one, all mm -hmm. your favorite places to go. But I want to talk about, uh, arches and Canyon lands outside of Moab. So what are your, some of your favorite places you're looking forward to going to next year when we head there? Uh, well, they're both pretty magical places. Uh, and it's funny because even though they're right next to each other, I mean, they're practically across the street. Um, mm -hmm. It's, they're different parks in the sense that uh, Arches is all about rock formations and things that are above the ground. And Canyon mm -hmm. Lands is kind of about things that are below the ground as you're getting canyons within canyons within canyons. I mean, it's, it's just surreal landscape, uh, both of them. Uh, but even though they're so close, you could do completely different photography in each. Uh, so anybody who's going out there, you have to go to both places. Don't don't fall in love with one and not visit the other. You've got to go to both spots. Um, arches is about the rock formations, uh, primarily the arches. I mean, that's the big attraction, of course, right? It's what the park is named for. So with Arches National Park, even when you're first coming into the park, there's lots of great places. I mean, people go there for the arches. Uh, but the rock formations in general are great. So like the whole area around uh, Courthouse Towers, there's uh, Park Avenue as well. These rock formations are fantastic to shoot. In fact, the area around Courthouse Towers is probably my favorite spot in the park to shoot, even though I'm not shooting arches there. Uh, it's just really great landscape photography in general. Uh, and then Canyonlands, uh, like I said, it's literally canyons within canyons. I mean, you, you can stand at the edge and, and you can, you're looking into a canyon and then you look further out and there's another canyon that goes, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's really intense to look at. Um, there's different, there's three different areas of the park there. My favorite is uh, at Island in the Sky. There's a section called Grand View. You go out on the road all the way to the end of Island in the Sky, which is, it's a plateau among the canyons. But you go out on this, uh, I think it's 1.8 miles. It's about two miles round trip to go out on this hike on what's essentially a, a peninsula off of this island in the sky. And you can see out uh, off to both sides. Uh, I think it goes north and south. Uh, uh, just these beautiful views over the canyon. You know, for a mile, you just think you hike for a mile and get the scenery changing next to you on both sides the whole way out. Uh, and it, it's, I don't know, it's just very inspiring. I'm very much about the experience of being in the parks as much about the photography. And I could spend a whole day in a spot like that and not take my camera out and, and it would be fine with me. It's just, it's just, they're all beautiful places that we're talking about. Right. What I really love about this is I'll talk to one photographer and they say, well, you got to go here, here, and here. Like those are like, you got to absolutely go there. And then no one else mentioned it. And then you say this place, Grandview, no one's mentioned that. Yeah. But like, that's how we set up our excursions is like, if that's like your favorite place, then you're going to go do that adventure and everyone's going to love doing it because of your enthusiasm for it. And we hit so many different places and yeah, I don't know that that's one of my favorite things about uh, how we set the whole thing up. Well, they're big places, so I'm not surprised that different people have different favorite spots. Right, right, exactly. And it's and you wouldn't think that this sounds weird. Like Acadia is really diverse because you're you're shooting gardens, and then you're shooting down on the rocks, and the waves are hitting you, uh, and then you're down the Jessup Path, and it's totally different. But even here, like you're saying, arches. Uh, everything's up above you. The canyon lands, you stand on the edge and look down on everything. It's also very diverse there, even though everything's, I don't know, rocky, uh, whatever. It's different. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> so, <coughs> so yeah, tell us, uh, where can we go find out more about what you have going on as far as uh, national parks at night and other stuff so people can check that out? Uh, okay. Well, National Parks at Night is a workshop program we do, as the name suggests, we do uh, night photography workshops in the parks. Uh, our 2000 itinerary, uh, we're going to be at uh, Rocky Mountain National Park and Capitol Reef, Biscayne, Redwoods, and Glacier. And then we've got some other non uh, sorry, non national park locations as well. Uh, but all that information is at nationalparksatnight.com. Uh, we also have a blog. Um, and some videos and a link to a creative live video we did. So the website's more about, it's more than about just our workshops. It's, it's kind of a hub for all the educational materials about night photography that we put together. 
Uh, and then uh, my website, Photographing National Parks, uh, is, uh, you know, it supports my book. Um, but again, I've got a, more information on there than just the book. Uh, I've got a newsletter and some articles about, about the parks and some, some great places to shoot in them. Fantastic. And if you guys can't tell from this video, like Chris, he's just uh, energetic. He's excited to be there. And he's just one of the most helpful photographers I've ever met that, uh, you know, people love li listening to the presentations, but going out and shooting with him is, is just a really special experience and getting all that help. So oh, thank thanks. you for everything you've done for us. And we really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. I, I love doing this work. You know, people ask me, um, you know, how you doing, how, how's business? And the, my answer has started to become, I'm very busy doing things I really like. Um, and yeah, I'm loving it, you know, spending this time in, in places that, that I like being and um, sharing that experience with other people. Uh, it's, it's very fulfilling. So I'm having a blast. It's called living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Good job. Uh, awesome. All right. Well, we can't wait to hang out with you in Moab. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Thanks for doing this video. I know people are getting a lot out of this and uh, we'll see you soon. Oh, thanks for having me, Chris. Look forward to seeing you again next year. Of course. All right. Thanks. Thanks to Chris Nicholson. Bye-bye.